What's up everybody, welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony, let's jump in. Happy Sunday everybody, I hope you're having a wonderful weekend, I'm sorry to disturb you on Sunday, indeed I normally like to have a rest on a Sunday, but the last few Sundays we've had to put up uh, special episodes because there's just too much to cover and I want to make sure you guys are on top of the latest developments coming out of China. Now this episode is a special one that's looking at several major developments in relation to Evergrande over the last few days, I want to make sure you guys are on top of these, I know that a lot of you guys who follow this channel are interested in the property sector, and frankly anyone who's interested following China needs to follow this Evergrande crisis carefully because it has such a huge flow and effect for the rest of the economy and for the political system in the country. Let's jump in. Earlier in the week we discussed a 158 billion US dollar California based asset management firm Oak Tree seizing land from Evergrande in Hong Kong which the crisis hit developer had intended to use to build a quote unquote Versailles like mansion. Indeed the piece of land was called Project Castle by Evergrande executives. Over the weekend, we have learned that this US distressed debt specialist firm has gone one step further and, in an incredible move, seized one of Evergrande's quote unquote most prized assets in mainland China itself. This is a first for an international investor affected by Evergrande's massive $300 billion crisis. A move which the Financial Times, which broke the story, described as, quote, a rare intrusion by a global investor in a domestic crisis caused by the biggest ever collapse of a property developer. End quote. A rare intrusion indeed. It's incredible that the firm was able to negotiate the domestic court environment so quickly to seize such a prized and expensive asset within the mainland itself as other powerful and well-connected interests within the country circle to pick apart the corpse that is Evergrande. It may well be because the asset was near Shanghai which has long had uh, a strong incentive to remain an attractive destination for international capital. The asset in question is part of the so-called Venice Project, a sprawling residential development on the Yellow Sea coast near the major mega center of Shanghai. Before the asset seizure, Evergrande had invested about 30 billion RMB, 4.7 billion US dollars in the project over the last decade. The project is currently marketing almost 300 apartments and has 66 million square feet of residential space. Construction included cordoning off several acres of ocean to dye the water a brighter shade of blue. No wonder this company is bankrupt. According to the Financial Times, the Venice project defaulted on a secured loan provided by Oak Tree late last year. The loan was around $400 million. Oak Tree loaned around $1 billion in total to two Evergrande projects. The default allowed the LA based Oak Tree to take control of the project's equity, restart construction, and begin selling its apartments. I agree with the Financial Times observations uh, on the peculiarness of this development. Quote, Oak Tree's highly unusual control over the huge mainland development shines a light on the otherwise opaque problems of Evergrande, which is expected to require the largest restructuring in China's history. The legal strength of foreign claims on Chinese assets has long been unclear, but there are no signs of any challenge from Beijing or other authorities to Oak Tree's moves." End quote. Now, one of the obvious consequences of Oak Tree's control over both Project Castle in Hong Kong, which we discussed a few days ago, and now its control over the Shanghai asset as part of Project Venice, is that Evergrande can now no longer sell them to raise cash as part of its own restructuring. Chinese financial media outlet Caixin Media reports over the weekend that shares of China Aoyuan Group plunged 8.1% after the property developer announced a deal to sell properties in Canada for about 170 million US dollars to repay loans. Aoyuan also said in a separate statement that its auditor, uh, Deloitte, has resigned because of a failure to agree to fees, which frankly is a very concerning sign. Aoyuan's Canadian unit will sell real estate projects in Burnaby, British Columbia to Anthem Properties Group through an agreement signed earlier in the week. 
We remember a few weeks back in January, Ao Yuan announced that it would not be able to pay back US dollar notes worth 1.1 billion US dollars. Okay, next up, when the Evergrande crisis first blew up last year, we discussed the many facets of the crisis, from buyers who paid for their apartments up front, to the billions owed to creditors, to the systemic relationship local governments have with housing development firms through land sales. Another area we discussed was the role of third-party suppliers, from furniture makers to plumbers, as a form of financing through commercial papers, basically IOUs to property developers, and as sectors in their own rights highly vulnerable to a downturn in the property market. Evergrande alone owes a whopping 31 billion US dollars to suppliers via commercial papers. It's worth looking at these secondary industries, these upstream industries, again this week, as there is now increased attention on them in the face of economic downturn generally, and the housing crisis specifically. Media reports warn of a growing number of Chinese construction companies writing off assets or issuing profit warnings, with more such disclosures expected this year, putting pressure on Beijing to do more to limit the financial contagion from the developers' crisis and to avoid job losses in the wider economy. For example, Reuters this week reported on Guangzhou, whole like Creative Home Co., a furniture maker which became the latest company to disclose losses linked to Evergrande. The company said in an exchange filing on Wednesday it expects 2021 net profits to slump more than 60% from a year earlier, quote, hurt by receivables to Evergrande that are unlikely to be collected. End quote. Another example pointed out was that of Beijing Jiayu Door Window and Curtain Wall Co., which said this week that it had seen, quote, a loss of up to 1.4 billion RMB last year, thanks to receivables from Evergrande that are likely to go sour. End quote. Reuters again disclosed the case of Guangdong Park Corp., a maker of lighting fixtures, which said it forecast, quote, an 85% to 90% drop in 2021 earnings thanks to a jump in Evergrande-related impairment losses, end quote. The analysts express that most China-listed companies will start reporting annual results next month, with more such disclosures expected as, quote, dozens of Chinese suppliers have disclosed debts owed by developers like Evergrande. End quote. And it is not just Evergrande which is the problem. We have seen this month alone dozens of reports in Chinese financial media about units of developers like Shimao Group Holdings, Kaisa Group Holdings and others failing to meet commercial paper payments on time. Indeed, according to Shanghai Commercial Paper Exchange, failure to meet commercial paper payments on time jumped 26% in December over the month before not a positive trend. All this means placing billions of dollars of losses on thousands if not tens of thousands of upstream suppliers employing millions of people across the country. Hey guys, I'd love to hear what you thought about some of the updates we covered in today's episode, so throw your comments below. Always love hearing from you. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.